available, made himself available, and uh, he's going to be uh, preaching this morning. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody here. Yeah. Strange thing, I uh, I grew up my beard so that if I do a bad job, I could say, well, the light wasn't so good in the cave I was in. <laughs> Anyways, um, let's just open up in a, in a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for just bringing your, your church together. We just pray that you'd speak to us through your word, Lord. It's, it's all about you, Lord. Uh, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word of God that proceeds from your mouth, Lord. So we just pray that I'd be just a vessel to, to highlight what's already, what's already been spoken. Um, Bless it to our hearts and our souls. Mm-hmm. Help it reach our, our hard heads and our sometimes hard hearts. Mm-hmm. And uh, just help us be open to what your spirit is doing mm-hmm. um, at this time. Bless the reading of your word. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'll just, uh, if you guys got your Bibles or your apps or whatever you use, uh, we're in chapter 10 of the book of John. But I'm going to have to first, uh, because chapter 9 and chapter 10 are, are actually attached, what I'll do, I'll do is read chapter 10 and then I'll just go over what was spoken of in chapter 9. So chapter 10 verses 1 through 11. Everybody there? Yeah. Okay, I got the old Bible. So uh, just uh, bear with me. Okay, chapter 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, He goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable Jesus spake unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them, and said Jesus again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, and the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. So I uh, titled this message, uh, Watch Your Manners, and you'll see why in a moment, but so chapter 9 and chapter 10 are actually, uh, they're together really, even though they're separated by chapters. So in order to understand who Jesus was speaking to and what the whole subject was and the situation, you you know the story of the blind man that was healed by Jesus. So um, you just look at... Just look over at uh, chapter 9, verse 8. It says that his neighbors, therefore, when they when they saw that the blind man had been healed, the neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is, is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. And so, uh, in his manner of speech, he spoke like a sheep. He, uh, he was blind, but now he could see. He, he, was, um, he was testifying what God had done for him. And so, as sheep, we testified that, that we were blind, and now we see. As for the, if you want to go down to the same chapter towards the end, 
the tail end of the chapter, so before we get into chapter 10, we'll understand it a little better. We read that in verse 35, after Jesus had heard that uh, the blind man had been cast out, uh, treated really badly, you know, he was um, called names, told off, and, and ostracized and excommunicated by the Pharisee. He then, uh, in verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found them, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see, that see not, might see, and that they which see, might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. So, the manner of speech of which the, the um, Pharisees were speaking is, is we see. They say we see. And that is a, a, conceitful, a conceitful way to, uh, to look at things, to be so sure of oneself um, in this situation. So you see the, the, the difference between the sheep that was blind, but now he could see and he testifies that I am he, I am the man who was healed. And we see the Pharisees like, we see, they're so sure of themselves. And so we're just going to, I'm just going to go over the, um, so now we know from this previous chapter that those listening to Jesus here in chapter 10, are the man born blind, who has just had his eyesight restored, some of the Pharisees and the Jews, and the disciples were with Jesus at the beginning of chapter 9, and so they still might be there. They usually were. And in verse 39 at the tail end, we read that Jesus said, "Judgment, I am for judgment I am coming to this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. To which the Pharisees responded, are we blind also? Jesus, knowing the hearts of men, mm. knows, mm. he knows full well mm. that the Pharisees are not sincere in their question. <laughs> They're always trying to uh, trap Jesus, tempt Jesus, and all kinds of tricks and trickery. And uh, they're not actually eager for knowledge. Uh, conceited people um, don't necessarily uh, think they need any excess knowledge. Therefore Jesus answers them, if you were blind, you should have no sin, but now you say we see, therefore your sin remaineth. You see, the Pharisees had such an excessively high estimation of their own abilities concerning spiritual matters, fancying themselves as the highest authority of the things of God. And because they sit in Moses' seat, they were the representatives of the law of God. But God, who formed the eye, can also see into the hearts. And he says that though outwardly they appear righteous unto men, but within they are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Jesus also says of the Pharisees that their works they do are to be seen by men. They love having VIP rooms at feasts, and chief seats in synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called rabbi, rabbi. But what they fail to see is that just because they, their works are seen and approved by men doesn't mean they're approved of by God. For God sees not as man sees. Now we've all seen the, uh, the televangelists, uh, there's people that crept into the church that um, are not really of the flock of God. They, uh, they, they're actually pleasing people by uh, offering carnal promises. Uh, Jesus doesn't offer carnal promises. 
Jesus offers his promises, which are, which are blessing promises of, of, uh, of hope, of an afterlife, and of a spiritual enlightenment and peace within that only God can give. Now, the, if people are preoccupied, if leaders are preoccupied with things of this world, they're going to not be able to nourish others with the bread of the word. So we're just going to just going to talk about um, he that entereth the door. Now in the uh, oh, verily, verily, <laughs> verse one again. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Jesus is referring to someone here, and that someone that he's referring to, rather than entering by the door, which would be the normal thing to do, um, climbs up another way. Now, normally when we go somewhere, we're building our house, we go through the front door. Um, or in this case, the front door of a sheepfold, which is a pen for the sheep. Logically, we do so by entering through the door. Unless, unless what? Unless we have no permission to be entering in the first place. Unless we have no business being there. So right out the gate, pun intended, we can easily surmise that this person is an intruder. But of course, we don't need to surmise anything because Jesus goes on to say about the person in question, the same is a thief and a robber. He is an intruder to the sheepfold. He doesn't have good intention and has no business being there. So he bypasses the door and climbs up some other way into the sheepfold with the intention to steal, kill, and destroy, as it says in verse 10. These intruders that Jesus is referring to are none other than da, 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 the Pharisee that he is talking to and the religious leaders of Israel that saw themselves as shepherds to the people. Time and time again, we've seen the Pharisees consider Jesus as an intruder to their religious system, so much so that they were planning to kill him. They saw themselves as the teachers and masters and scholars of the word of God, yet they opposed Jesus because they saw him as an intruder, but in actuality, they were the ones trespassing. And so that brings me to the next matter, which is manner of breach. We have the Lord, who we're going to see in the next verse. He is the shepherd, and he comes through the door. And so the sheep say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We have need of nothing. As sheep, the Lord is our portion. In his sheepfold, he is the provider. But of course... I'm going to call them the creeps because it rhymes with sheep. <laughs> they, and plus, they're creeping around. And they're also, you know, you picture like um, just like a snake, right? Um, slithering around low to the ground and creeping in. And so they're creeps. And the creeps say, gimme, 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 because they're thieves and robbers. So they're only concerned with what they can get uh, from the sheepfold. They're snake oil salesmen, they're charlatans and they enter not by the door. The, yet when they, so they oppose Jesus, like I was saying, and they're the ones that are actually trespassing. Which brings us to the sheepfold. Rather than entering by the door, which we find out in verse seven is Christ, these Pharisees and religious leaders are climbing up some other way to invade the sheepfold. So what exactly is the sheepfold? Now the sheepfold is a holy place by design. And I'll tell you how I know that. Because Christ calls himself the door. Christ himself is the door to the sheepfold. And his sheep are inside. So this is a holy place by design. In other words, a place provided and prepared by God to inhabit his people. A place set apart by God 
for his set apart people to inhabit. You see, when God promised to Abraham that he would make a great nation of him, he also promised him a land. And that land would be for his many descendants. They would dwell there. It was the promised land. And then 400 years later, when God rescues the Hebrew people from the bond, the bond uh, leader, which was Pharaoh and the Egyptians, by the hand of Moses, Moses and the children of Israel sang a song. And it went, there was a line in the song that it went like this. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people with thou which thou hast redeemed. So we see there are redeemed people. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. And so this sheepfold is the house of Israel, the land of promise housed by the people of Israel, and the sheepfold is sacred ground, because it was ordained by God to house his sheep there. Thy holy habitation, in which God's people dwell, was established by thy hands, O Lord Emmanuel. Now sheepfolds and shepherding are foreign to most of us in this part of the world, but for people in the Middle East, and especially to those in the Old Testament uh, Jewish community, not only was it an important vocation, but the patriarchs of the nation of Israel were all shepherds by trade. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, when Joseph brought his family into Egypt, and Pharaoh asked them, what is, what is your occupation? He asked his brothers. What did they answer him? Thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And Joseph and his brothers, the 12 original forefathers of the 12 tribes of Israel, were shepherds. In other words, Israel is a nation that was descended from shepherds. And then remember Moses? Remember when he was, he was called to lead Israel out of Egypt? What was he doing? He was shepherd. He was literally keeping watch over his father-in-law's flock the moment God first called him. And let us not forget Israel's most important and godliest king, David. When God sent Samuel to anoint one of Jesus' sons as king, of, of Jesse's sons as king, sorry, seven of the sons passed by, and the Lord had not chosen any of them to be king. And so Samuel asked, asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? And Jesus answered, Jesse answered, there is still the youngest. He is tending the sheep. And when David was brought in, the Lord said to Samuel, rise and anoint him, this is the one. The shepherd boy became king of Israel. And that shepherd boy wrote many psalms, one of which is the 23rd Psalm, that as you all know, says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside still waters. And yes, in the Old Testament and the New, God himself is presented as, as a shepherd. A shepherd for his people, and it was shepherds that were watching over the flocks at night, that were visited by angels, and were told of the good news of the birth of Christ, God our shepherd, born as a lamb. So we read in this, this second verse here in chapter 10, he that entereth by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. This shows us the contrast between the intruder that we talked about that trespassed into the sheepfold and the true shepherd that enters by the door. He is the rightful owner and he cares for the sheep. 
Unlike the intruder who comes into the sheepfold under false pretense, to use the self-appointed authority to eat the fat of the sheep and clothe themselves with the wool. They slaughter the fatlings and they feed themselves, but they do not feed the flock. Like I was saying earlier, they're not giving the bread of God to the people, which is the word of God. They're not honoring God with their life so that they're not able to, they're just concerned with carnal things. And so it just breeds more carnality and they end up actually harming God's own. So this is the manner of breach where they're saying, the Pharisees are saying, give me, give me, give me. They have the attitude of a thief and a robber. In Ezekiel 34, verses 10 and 11, it says, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease the feeding of sheep, of feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. Now if he that entereth by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, and if Christ is the shepherd, both the shepherd and the door, what does that mean? Well, it means that Christ, the good shepherd, enters by his own authority. Christ, the eternal shepherd, enters by way of the incarnation. Christ incarnate, crucified, is the door to our salvation. Just as he enters into a holy place once by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Amen. So, that was the manner of breach. The Pharisees coming through the door, the creeps creeping in, saying, give me, give me, give me, give me some more. Um, don't ask what for. And uh, the sheep coming in and saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's the difference, it's a big contrast. Um, now we're, we're going to reach the point of the manner of teach. I'm sorry, I got the sniffles, and it's probably annoying because I hate when people have the sniffles. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably still going to happen, eh? so try to ignore it. <laughs> we'll sniffle with you. <laughs> we should start a sniffle with Corbin. Really. No, um, okay, back to the serious news here. So, so now we're at the point of manner of teach. We're going to read uh, go over verses 3 and 6 from chapter 10. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. This is the manner of teach. The sheep, uh, to the Lord they bow their knee, and to the stranger they will flee. And for the creep, they say, put your trust in me. Put your trust in me, and they make it all about them. They make it so that they're the authority that you have to bypass. This is something a common practice in cults. Hopefully none of you have ever been in it. But um, they make it so that I'm the guy, that I'm the leader, I'm the pastor, I'm the teacher, I'm the authority, that the kingpin, that you have to, you can only have knowledge from God or access to God through me. You know, you must confess your sins to me. You must uh, come to me and give me your money. Uh, what do they say again? They say, um, sow something and you'll get a harvest and all that jazz. We won't name any names. <coughs> many of them. <laughs> but uh, there's tons of them. There's tons of them. They come out of the woodwork. They're just as bad as the Pharisees were and um, they're like relentless and they never stop coming. 
But um, if you if you hear this, the you know the stranger's voice is not from God. And uh, I'm just going to read a bit about that. So, to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. Now the porter opens the door, so that the shepherd is revealed to Israel, his sheep. Now this porter that opens the door is already on the scene when the shepherd gets there. And he, yeah, the shepherd appears, and the porter is there prior hearing the shepherd's voice. Now, some may think this order is, is irrelevant to the parable, but I can't help but think of a certain somebody. In John chapter 1, 6, 8, we read, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same name, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. And we know John the Baptist, whose sole ministry was to prepare Israel and open the door, so to speak. He was sent by God ahead of Christ to baptize the people so that Christ could be made manifest to Israel. In John chapter 1, verse 29, 31, 31 we read the next day, John seeth Jesus coming on to him, and he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me. For he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And then when the people come to John, they ask him, they say, you know, that guy you bore witness of the other day, he's up there and all of them are coming to him and he's baptizing them, all the people. And John said, a man can receive nothing unless it was given to him from heaven. So John was telling Israel that this Jesus is, <laughs> is sent from God. He didn't receive this ministry, you know, uh, on his own, like the Pharisees. He's, he's sent from God, and he is the one. He's the Messiah. And John says, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoices great, greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy is fulfilled. He must increase, I must decrease. Sounds like the words of a, of a porter. Just like, I was just thinking, you can actually... Just even those words, like, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. You can say, he that hath the sheep is the shepherd. But the porter of the bride, of the shepherd, which standeth and heareth him, he heareth him calling the sheep. He rejoiceth greatly because of the shepherd's voice. And, and if you notice, like John the Baptist, he, he, he rejoiced like that. He was so happy to hear Jesus proclaiming. It was, um, he didn't even think he should undo his sandals, you know. So John had such a, even, even when he was in his mother's womb, when he heard Mary coming, he left for joy. If, that, if those stories don't reduce you to tears, you've got a heart made of stone, you know what I mean? It's unreal. I'm getting emotional because uh, I, uh, that cave got to me. <laughs> So the sheep, the sheep hear the shepherd's voice. The sheep will not follow a stranger's voice. You see, although the disciples had been witnessing all the negative reports and dismissive reports of the Pharisees towards Christ, they still chose to follow Jesus instead because they knew his voice. The Pharisees were merely strangers to them. And, and so the sheep, 11 of the 12 disciples, fled from them. But Judas, being a picture of the Antichrist, has a thought at the Last Supper. A thought that Satan has put in his heart and that he entertains. And we are told Satan enters Judas. And as soon as Satan enters him, what is, where does he run to? He doesn't run to the shepherd. He runs directly to the thieves and the robbers to betray Christ. And that is because that is something that Satan and natural man have in common, 
Both man and Satan are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Satan is the originator of opposing the things of God. He is the originator of opposing the plan of God. And likewise, the natural man does not receive the things of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them. And don't forget, to be independent from the plan of God was how the serpent originally appealed to Eve's pride with Adam following suit. And likewise, the Pharisees were called serpents and vipers by Jesus and John the Baptist. Because like Jesus said, they may have been Abraham's children by ethnicity, but spiritually they remain dead children of the devil. Because they had rather put their hope in the things of man rather than hope in God. And sadly, prophecy tells us that, you know, um, Bible prophecy tells us that in the same way they tried to dismiss Jesus by hooking up with Judas, who was a picture of the Antichrist, they're going to try to team up to dismiss intruders with the real Antichrist, and they're going to make a pact with the devil because they put their hopes in man rather than their hopes in the plan of the God man. When reading this chapter carefully, I can't help but notice that it doesn't really elaborate on the sheep, per se, but rather focuses attention on the sheep's relation to the shepherd. The sheep are only mentioned in regards to their relation with the shepherd, as we see in verses 3 and 4. The sheep know his voice, they hear his voice, he calls his own sheep by name, he, he pulleth forth his own sheep, and leadeth them out and goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. This shows us the ownership of the shepherd, the leadership of the shepherd, the authority of the shepherd. And where did this ownership, leadership, and authority of the shepherd and the sheep begin? Well, we looked at how important shepherding was to Israel. We looked at how God was their shepherd. But let's look at what Moses said to the Israelites just before they went into the promised land. He said, because, because he loved your fathers, God, because God loved your fathers, he chose their descendants after them and brought you out of Egypt by his presence and great power to drive out before you nations greater and mightier than you and to bring you into their land and give it to you for your inheritance as it is this day. The, the sheep are a people set apart. The Lord chose Jacob as his inheritance unto himself and Israel for his particular for peculiar treasure, and gave them their land for an heritage for his people. And Jesus said in Matthew 15, verses 24, that I was sent to the I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And so in this in this story, Jesus hasn't been on the cross yet. He's not crucified yet. He came to the Israelites. And he came because they're the ones with the history. They're the ones with, with all the backstory. Like, um, we read in Romans 9, 4, and 5. Who are the Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promise? Who are the fathers and of whom are, as concerning the flesh, Christ came? Who is over all? God blessed forever. So, all these promises, all these, the things Moses was taught by God, these were all to, um, to get this people ready for when Christ was going to come, their shepherd was going to come, and he had a bone to pick with the false shepherds. How are we for time? Pastor Aaron? Are we okay for time? <laughs> I don't want to feel like I'm reading a lot. So, the Lord had chosen a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The, the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the house, the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. See, the reason the patriarchs of Israel were truly loved by God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was because they were set apart. 
by God. They may have been shepherds by trade in an earthly, in an earthly sense, but they were sheep by faith in matters of faith. They followed the God of Israel. When he called them and led them out, they followed. Because, like we were saying, they were earthly shepherds by trade, but sheep by faith. In contrast, the Pharisees and religious leaders of Israel were spiritual, spiritual shepherds by trade, or religious shepherds by trade, but strangers to faith. And so those self-appointed religious leaders saw themselves as the shepherds of the people, but they had not entered through the door that God had provided. It's a real life parable. It's a real life parable that the patriarchs, the patriarchs of God's people were earthly shepherds called by God to be spiritual shepherds. And the self-appointed spiritual shepherds were in actuality intruders of the sheepfold. Just as, man, just as the man born blind had acknowledged his earthly blindness was in actuality the one to see Jesus for who he was and worship him as the son of God. But the Pharisees that did not have impaired vision were utterly blind spiritually and saw Jesus as an intruder. So, uh, I'll just... I'll just talk about this for a second. The manner of reach. The manner of reach is that the sheep were once lost and now they're found. God reached out to them and he came to save them. And he came to take them out of the bondage of religion, the bondage of the Jewish religion, because it had been hijacked. He's the one who set it up. But then it got hijacked by religious mobsters. And um, the Pharisees were the ones that yelled, crucify him. They wanted the shepherd of Israel dead, and they got their wish. But little did they know it would work out in the world's favor because that was God's plan. And when the, we read that uh, about the reach in uh, 7 and 10, we just read that all that came before me were thieves and robbers. The sheep did not hear them. You notice when Jesus came, he called his disciples. How did he call them? He called them by name. Simon, Andrew, James, follow me. And they followed him because the sheep hear his voice and he called his sheep out by name and leaded them. He sent them as sheep among wolves to the lost sheep of Israel. He called them his little flock. And did Jesus go before his little flock? He sure did. Did they follow him? They sure did. They all died martyrs' death. And John on the island of Patmos. And he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep. Before the shearers, before his shearers, he was silent. So he did not open his mouth. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And just, a, just one last note is the manner of, I just wanted to talk about the manner of preach before we go. Um, the Pharisees could not understand that Jesus spoke of spiritual things because the spiritual the spirit of God only only can concern uh, discern those things and so the Pharisees could never understand him when he said to Nicodemus that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit because a man must be born again of the spirit see if you've been born here today once in your life uh, in the natural man that means if you haven't been born again, that means you haven't gone through the gate. You see, that, the gate I was talking about was the first gate. We're not going to talk, we're not going to cover this whole chapter right now. I already probably went over time, but it doesn't matter because these are the things of God and they're much more important than a little bit of overtime. <laughs> That's true. <Can't> preach. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. I just got to finish my point here because God has this on my heart. So I'm just saying that. The, they were blind to the things of God, and, and we are also blind to the things of God. And we need Jesus Christ as the door to get into the kingdom of heaven. Because now that he's been crucified, only his blood can get us there. He's the sacrifice for our sins. 
I mean, look to the world. You really gonna put your hope in this place? I mean, they don't even know certain things we should know already. I'm not gonna get into it. <laughs> but their, their thoughts have become like so corrupt and they've been made a laughing stock because you can't mock God. You can't turn on the Lord of all creation that has put order into the system and expect good results. You really think that's gonna happen for you? Good luck. But I'm telling you, you're gonna be, you're gonna either be deceived or deceived. You're gonna be like a blind guide or you're gonna be led by a blind guide and you're gonna fall off a ravine. But Jesus is the only one that actually cares for your soul today. So if anybody here wants to reach out to Christ Jesus right now in their heart, he knows you just the way he knew his lambs. He knows you just the way he knows his sheep. He came as a lamb. Do you see anybody that cares for you being born as a lamb? The God of all creation was born in a manger because he's the shepherd of your soul. Don't give your soul to somebody else. Don't waste your soul on this life. Give your soul to the one that owns it. The shepherd of your soul, Jesus Christ. Born a lamb so that he could take your sins away on the cross. The cross wasn't for nothing. Don't misunderstand it. Don't think it's just a decoration or a religion or because your parents believe in it or because of it. But the reality of the situation is Jesus Christ is the king. King of kings and lord of lords. Are you going to bow down to an earthly king, an earthly lord? Are you going to get fooled by your own deceptive self that falls so easily? Let's not kid ourselves. You know, we're so distracted by menial things. Are we not? Don't we need a shepherd who knows us and knows our name and calls us and leads us because he cares about us? He has a staff. And one day he's going to have an rod, iron rod on the throne. And I tell you, you better get ready now because now he's offering grace and mercy and love and forgiveness. We don't want to say no to that. Amen. Why refuse a gift when the giver is God himself? Amen. And he purchased, he purchased you on a cross. Don't refuse his blood. He shed that for your sins because God's wrath had to be paid. And the, the, you know, the option is open. So let's just, in a word of prayer, if anybody needs to get closer to God again today, either renew your relationship with him. And you know, we need to renew our relationship with him every day. Or maybe today you're not saved and you don't even have an idea what I'm talking about. Like the Pharisees didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. But that's okay. Because God can make things clear to you today. If you just put your trust in him. I'm not here. I'm not a charlatan and snakes oil salesman. I don't even have a dollar to take from you or give you. <laughs> <laughs> but the word of God is the most precious thing because it's, it's the living word of God that he gave us. And what's his, his son, is he gave his son, God gave his son. It's the most precious thing. So let's just end it in a word of prayer. And if you want to say in your hearts that you want to accept Jesus Christ today as your Lord and Savior and you haven't already, now is the time to do so. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this, this morning. Thank you, Lord, for putting this message on my heart. Thank you for coming into this world and, and making a plan for our salvation when no one else would do it. Lord, you're the only one you're the only one that can do it. You're the only shepherd that is high and mighty, that has made a provision and has died on the cross for our sins, Lord God. Help us not harden our heart today like the Pharisees did. Help us not harden our heart like Pharaoh did. And they only led to their own shame. Like Judas is carrying, who turned his back on you for money and for maybe recognition. But he ended up hanging himself out of guilt Lord, help us not go down a road of guilt today. Help us give our guilt to you, Jesus Christ. You carried our guilt on the cross. You carried our shame. You carried our, our sin, Lord. You paid the price. And we thank you so much because we don't appreciate that price enough. Help us in our hearts today. If anybody really wants to reach out to you, Lord, show them you've already reached down. You already came down to this earth. You've already risen from the grave. You've already ascended onto heaven to intercede for us, to hear our prayers. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for this morning. I just pray that your word reaches our hearts today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>